kindly request you to turn on the video if you're not too comfortable. So guest speakers don't have to speak to black screens. So, <clears throat> um, first I would like to introduce myself. I am Yukiko Shu. Um, um, I'm from Japan and I'm an MPH student in uh, EHESP. So um, here I we, we have uh, Dr. Kento Riwate as a guest, guest speaker. So um, I will quickly uh, introduce Dr. Iwata first and I um, move to um, interview. So I will share my screen to uh, introduce Dr. Iwata. Can you see? Okay, um, so um, Dr. Kentaro Iwata is a medical doctor. He is an infectious disease expert and uh, he has graduated from medical university in Japan. And after graduating from uh, university, he, he, has, uh, he, ha he had international uh, working experience such as in US, China, Africa and Japan. And throughout the, this international experience, he dealt with uh, Ebola and um, SARS. And also I would like to note that he is very um, active in social media. His Twitter followers is over 200,000. And um, as for this COVID-19, he worked as a member of medical team for the first mass infection on cruise ship in 2020. Here, I would like to um, elaborate more about this um, cruise ship. So, um, so um, mass infection in a cruise ship that happened in February of 2020 uh, when when there are very few cases had yet to be confirmed in Japan. And as you can see on the map, the cruise ship departed from Japan with more than 3000 passengers in January in 2020 and made a tour all the way down to Taiwan, Hong Kong, Vietnam, um, Okinawa, a little island in Japan, and then came back to Japanese mainland. On the way, the mass infection happened in the cruise ship and Dr. Iwata boarded the cruise ship as a member of medical team to deal with the infected patients. This is one of the first outbreaks of COVID-19 in Japan. However, the team, which was led by people outside the infection control specialists, was ignorant of infection prevention measures and couldn't control the situation well. Um, Dr. Iwata shared his findings on YouTube and it got a lot of public attention. For this reason, Dr. Iwata has been observing the pandemic and its information dynamics on social media ever since the beginning of COVID-19 outbreak, COVID outbreak. So, um, so this is the end of um, introduce of uh, Dr. Iwata. So I will now um, head to interviews. So. Um, if you guys have any questions, don't hesitate to raise a hand. I will give the later half of the time to uh, question time from the participants that if you have any, any questions in the middle of our conversations, just please don't hesitate. Okay. Um, so Dr. Iwata, thank you for coming today. Well, thank you for having me. Uh -huh. And. Uh, Okay, uh, I will head to uh, first question, sorry. Um, I would like to ask you about the current uh, trend on misinformation that is going around in Japan. So okay. um, uh, it has been two, year, two and a half years since the COVID pandemic started. Um, how do you think uh, misinformation has changed? And I'm sure it has significantly changed from the early period of pandemic to now when we are 
slowly getting out of pandemic in Japan. Okay. Um, we do not have a quantitative analysis regarding the social media or <clears throat> any misinformation regarding a COVID-19 pandemic, but uh, it feels like that uh, uh, I think the uh, we now see more and more a sort of misinformation uh, inside Japan and it spreads faster and faster. And the, uh, this is probably driven by uh, several different factors. Um, as you all of you might know that uh, Japan has been doing pretty well on uh, COVID-19 response. Uh, we were pretty successful in keeping the number of the patients down and so were the number of the deaths. And the uh, vaccination rollout uh, in 2021 was fairly successful and it was very quick in distributing the, all the vaccines uh, in uh, preventing the death among the risky groups such as elderly people. However, after about two years of endurance and the social uh, persevere uh, um, resistance or the restriction of the social life, I think now people are beginning to be uh, more angry, um, the uh, not really obedient, unlike the two years ago and the people are uh, uh, seeing more and more misinformation regarding the what the government or maybe a WHO is uh, dealing with. A uh, lot of information, misinformation was spread, uh, particularly in the field of vaccines. Uh, a lot of people uh, believe that the vaccine against COVID-19 is not effective it's, and it can be even dangerous not based on the fact and data, but based on uh, lots of uh, uh, misinformation provided by uh, SNS such as Twitter or YouTube. And this kind of media uh, is used by uh, so-called influencers uh, who are not really uh, specialists in this field, but are uh, uh, really vocal in spreading their opinions regarding the vaccinations. Uh, the kind of... Uh, misunderstood as well. So it's not just a manipulation of the information, but the uh, some sort of misunderstanding is also omnipresent. The typical example is the uh, misuse of denominator. This happened when uh, Israel started to have the outbreak during the rollout of a third vaccine, so-called booster. And the Israel started to see more and more people with COVID-19 were hospitalized uh, because of the uh, several waves of the uh, surge of infections. And if you look at the hospital wards, uh, people noticed that the majority of the people who were hospitalized in Israel were vaccinated already. And only a small segment of the patients who were hospitalized were not vaccinated. After noting this phenomenon, a lot of people started to complain that the vaccine is not really working and the people who are not vaccinated were really uh, people who are less hospitalized. Obviously, this is a misuse of a denominator because the majority of the people in Israel were already vaccinated and the number of the proportion of the people who were hospitalized uh, where the majority of people were already vaccinated. So the, it is obvious to see the more people who were vaccinated were in the hospital because only small proportion of the people were not vaccinated. So it I is very simple. Sorry. Yes. Uh, I have a Go ahead. Question, quick question because but uh, how does this um, manipulated denominator uh, created? Is, is it by media or? No, it's not really a manipulation of the data. It's just a misunderstanding, misunderstanding. of the information. It, it's not a, uh, it's not a evil thought or not really a, a, a wrong uh, belief. 
but uh, purely the misunderstanding of the use of the uh, numbers or data. Uh, mm -hmm. But the people are easily, uh, easily uh, deceived by this kind of uh, simple information right. and jump to it. Okay. And the, any anti-boxers, for example, would jump to this kind of misunderstanding. Yes. And mm -hmm. probably then uh, people who are anti-boxers might manipulate this kind of uh, small misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, so, um, okay, so I'll, there are uh, some misinformation about um, boxing. Yeah, uh, may I add forms. one more information regarding this? Sure, okay. Uh, actually, uh, this is not just the ordinary people who were uh, deceived by this sort of simple misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Actually, even the specialists and the uh, bureaucrats and the politicians okay. in Japan were equally deceived by uh, this kind of misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a recent example of uh, COVID-19 uh, cases among children. Mm -hmm. Recently, Japan's government and the Institute of Infectious Diseases uh, displayed the data that the uh, there were about 15 to 17 uh, deaths due to COVID-19 among children. Mm -hmm. And they said that uh, majority of people uh, who died uh, among children were not vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was used as the uh, sort of uh, encouragement to people and the pair, particularly the parents to get a COVID-19 vaccination. So mm -hmm. the, uh, I think this came from the sound motivation, but the, actually the understanding was wrong mm -hmm. because in Japan, uh, more than 80% of the children are not still vaccinated. So the, uh, again, the same misunderstanding or the uh, a kind of example of the Simpsons paradox that the, if, if the majority of the people are not vaccinated, then the people who die of COVID-19, again, profound uh, percentage of people will not be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So we cannot really conclude that just 15 to 70 people uh, or children who died of COVID-19 and the 70, 80% of them were not vaccinated, so mm -hmm. is that because of the lack of vaccination uh, that led to the death of the children or not? Uh, scientifically speaking, we cannot really uh, conclude by this information, but unfortunately, uh, several experts and the bureaucrats and even politicians use this information as the uh, encouragement of the vaccination, which mm -hmm. I don't think it is right, even though the uh, mm, the background uh, motivation is sort of sound because mm -hmm. if you misuse the information, somebody might detect this and the, that will be the uh, uh, beginning of the uh, disbelief uh, against the government and the Institute of Infectious Diseases and also the uh, we, the infectious disease experts. I see. So sorry if I'm not mistaken. So you're not really recommend vaccination to young children, or is it? I'm not saying girl? that. I'm not saying that. But the, uh, the we cannot use the data or information that the majority of people who died of COVID nineteen mm -hmm. or uh, children were not vaccinated might not be the reason uh, due to the lack of vaccination. I think somebody is raising a yeah, hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Thank you for that wonderful um, insight about social media uh, affecting the vaccination, uh, Dr. Kentaro Iwata. Um, I would like to ask, um, do you think that it's in Japan that vaccination um, in social media is being politicized and sensationalized? Uh, I, I'm not saying that. <laughs> But the, uh, I think I gave mm -hmm. an example of recent uh, broadcasting and the media uh, stating regarding the death of children. Uh, because uh, you, as you might know that the, uh, the, 
uh, COVID-19 among children were uh, relatively uh, less important topic. Uh, they were less likely to get a COVID-19 and they were less likely to die. Uh, this changed since the beginning of Omicron surge because Omicron is uh, easy to spread among children. Uh, but what I'm trying to say is that even if the, uh, uh, the vaccination program is successful and the vaccination program might be even more successful by stating that the children should get the vaccines and the uh, people dying of COVID-19 uh, mm -hmm. who are not vaccinated, uh, but that is not scientifically correct. And if you are not providing the accurate information, even though that is sort of uh, kind of pro-vaccine, uh, I think this might be counter-effectiveness, uh, counter-effective in the long run because some evil anti-vaxxer might use this as the, uh, to lose the trust to the government and the Institute of Infectious Diseases. This is what I'm trying to say. Uh, overall, I think the, uh, the government of Japan is fair in spreading the information regarding a vaccination, uh, maybe 80% to 90% soundly, and uh, we are not really manipulating uh, the vaccination information to sort of uh, manipulate the people in Japan. Uh, I think, did, you, did I answer your question? Yes, yeah, yes, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Uh, and I think, um, that's correct. Anti-vaccination movement are around social media. And I think, um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kindara. My pleasure. You can, so, do you yeah, want to, um, to raise a second question or do you have some Oh more? yeah, so you mentioned that um, um, misuse of data spread mm -hmm. in, in the country. And you, so, you also talked that um, it also spreads amongst the health professionals. So um, do you think this is this misinformation or misuse of data argued well in Japan in general? What about among health professionals? Well, um, you know, the, the, we cannot discuss all the healthcare professionals equally. Uh, generally, I think the quality of healthcare professionals in Japan is pretty high. Uh, we do take care of uh, a lot of patients with a quite a good standard of care, and the, we achieved a lot of uh, good healthcare outcomes. However, I have to admit that the, in the field of infectious diseases, uh, we are not really uh, on top of everything. Uh, our vaccination programs do have a lot of shortcomings in the long run, not even before the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, mm -hmm. We do have uh, lots of issues regarding the use of antibiotics uh, appropriately. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You mm -hmm. have uh, problems with the so-called data science. Uh, we don't have a lot of experts in data science. So the lots of health policies or public health measures regarding the infectious diseases were not necessarily uh, evidence-based, but uh, uh, more likely to be intuitively or experience-based uh, uh, response. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, we do have a lot of inefficiency in reporting and the analyzing the data. Uh, uh, somebody might have heard that the Japan is still using uh, uh, paper and stamps <laughs> and facts in collecting the yes. uh, it's all human driven. Uh, we don't have any automated system in collecting and analyzing data. So we have to sweat a lot in doing this kind of job every day. Uh, so we do have a lot of things we have to improve. Uh, so the, uh, that is not to say that, uh, you know, we do not have a good healthcare system overall. So the uh, focusing on infectious diseases, uh, we, we have a peculiarity uh, among the a lot of healthcare issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, I, I think some of the issues based on system um, is based on system, as you said, like uh, lack of data science or um, shortage of data collecting. So I agree with you. So um, 
I also like to know about your um, clinical experience, but what difficulties originated from misinformation you faced in your clinical practice during pandemic? Okay. Yeah, well, uh, there are lots of problems, and the, even among the healthcare professionals. The well, um, overall, COVID nineteen has over information. We mm -hmm. do have uh, so many informations regarding mm -hmm. uh, COVID nineteen, yeah. uh, including the uh, all the reviewed and edited uh, clinical trials and the articles and analysis. And some of them are really contradictory, and the, uh, some of them do not agree with each other. So the, it is very difficult to uh, summarize the all the published data in determining that uh, which is a, a, a appropriate care and which is not. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we did have a lot of uh, debate regarding the use of medications, for example, against the COVID-19. And some of them are evidence-based, but uh, many of them did not have a clear sound clinical evidence. And the Japan generally has a tendency in encouraging uh, medications uh, invented by Japanese pharmaceutical companies. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, the beginning was Fabipiravir. Fabipiravir is the antiviral medication, which was originally uh, invented to fight against influenza. Then it was later used against the Ebola virus disease in Africa. Then uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, it was uh, expected that the, uh, it might work against COVID-19. And the late prime minister uh, Shinzo Abe even mentions that uh, uh, Fabipiravir or the commercial name Abigan might be the key in fighting against COVID-19. Then later came ivermectin. As you know, the ivermectin is very effective in uh, uh, fighting against a lot of parasitic diseases, particularly the scabies and the strongyloidosis. And it was again uh, expected it might work against COVID-19 and the, because the invention of ivermectin uh, was done by uh, one of the Japanese uh, 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 scientists who won the uh, Nobel Prize for this uh, work. Uh, we Japanese really loved this medicine because you know it is kind of Japanese taste. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the uh, and recently the uh, one Japanese pharmaceutical company called Shionogi again invented their uh, anti COVID nineteen medication, which is oral tablets, and the clinical trial successfully demonstrated that the decreased viral load, the, so the virus would be decreased in the body. However, it did not show a clinical effectiveness uh, in preventing the important COVID-19 outcomes such as death, hospitalization, or clinical cure. So largely speaking, we specialists thought this medicine is good in decreasing the virus, but not really good in treating people. And the, because we always try to treat people rather than suppressing the virus per se, so we felt that medicine is failure. But again, mm -hmm. a lot of Japanese scientists were really against this kind of expert opinion because it's a Japanese company. So the, again, people tried to push this medicine as a very good one uh, based on this, what do you call it? Um, chauvinistic or I don't know the appropriate word for it, but a, a very, uh, 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 pro-Japan kind of attitude. Okay. And this sort of twisted the uh, development of the sound guideline. And the, we now know that for the mild to moderate COVID-19, the best medicine to fight against is uh, uh, Paxlovid, which is a tablet and the antiviral medication. But uh, in Japan, the Paxlovid is not really effectively used because it's a foreign uh, country's uh, tablet. And mm -hmm. so this is sort of politics rather than the science. And that we still need to improve our system in uh, keeping up with the science rather than the politics. Uh, I accept that the, uh, we have to respect the Japanese company. Uh, and uh, I accept that the Japanese business is important. I don't 
think it is not important, but uh, mm -hmm. you can't really use uh, useless medications simply okay. based on the uh, origin of country. So this kind of things, we need a uh, further improvement. Okay, so um, you mean this strong push of Japanese uh, medication of COVID-19 is originated from the strong relationship between Japanese doctors and Japanese pharmaceutical companies and that drive people act emotionally rather than logically? Yeah, and the, uh, the, the biggest problem in this issue is that the misinformation is provided by an expert. So the common yes. people have no way in distinguishing yeah. mm -hmm. between the sound, clear evidence and mm -hmm. misinformation. Mm -hmm. uh, we do still have a so-called whistleblowers, including me. <laughs> and the, we, were, we try not to be biased uh, on this kind of uh, uh, so-called conflicts of interest. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the experts receive quite a money or stocks from the many companies and the uh, many experts, including me, don't receive these kind of monetary uh, incentives. And so that might alter the, the way you express the opinion in mm -hmm. regards to the recommendation in the treatment of COVID-19. So this kind mm -hmm. of conflict of interest issue has existed for decades. Uh, mm -hmm. in the world yeah. but mm -hmm. uh, and not uh, only in Japan oh, but in the world right yeah. right but uh, yeah. I think we have not dealt with this and the uh, made a clear uh, guidance or uh, 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 rules in dealing mm -hmm. with uh, mm -hmm. yet so this has caused uh, quite a problem uh, again still uh, also people uh, there still is a hand. Yeah. ivermectin is the best medicine against the mm -hmm. COVID-19 and which is driven by the, some of the experts who receive some money uh, okay. from some. Okay, sorry. Um, I see a hand. So go ahead if yes. you have a question. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Chair. Um, how do you think red tape can be avoided between pharmaceutical companies and the government? Uh, yes, good question. Uh, first, we have to always declare that any existence of conflicts of interest upon recommending any kind of medications or even vaccinations against uh, any certain diseases. If we do have uh, financial incentives and receiving uh, quite amount of money or stocks mm -hmm. or whatever, the, uh, which might render the uh, expert opinion, that has to be at least disclosed. Uh, and if you don't disclose this information, then you, and many people would say that, uh, oh, you are hiding uh, your information and uh, you are hiding that uh, you received the money and that would completely alter the uh, respect uh, to the uh, statement of the experts. Uh, so this is a significant problem. But we have to keep the uh, level of statement by the experts as the uh, high standard. And we have to make sure that the, we, uh, we keep being honest and the science driven and not, not money driven. And the people might not trust us uh, if we do have uh, this sort of monetary issues. Thank you um, for pointing out strongly about transparency in the government and pharmaceutical companies. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you so much. So now I move on. Oh, sorry, Liana, please. Yeah. Sorry, good, good morning or good afternoon, Dr. Iwata. Thank you. Um, I just yeah. had a question concerning sure. um, your presence on social media. So I know that you have many Twitter followers and maybe you've had to respond mm -hmm. to questions yourself mm -hmm. from patients yeah. or from just the general population. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to know like from a public health perspective, like what is what would you say are the, you know, um, what's the best way to approach someone who has some mistrust and then ask a question on social media? How do you approach them? Thank you very much for your good question. Uh, it is very difficult to deal with a lot of uh, retweet, so-called, uh, in responding to uh, my comments. 
I do have uh, several rules in me. First, I never respond to the uh, personal question by the patients uh, because I don't make any recommendations to anybody who I did not see and examine by myself. So the, I always say that I cannot really respond to uh, your question because I didn't see you personally. This is my response to the, say like, uh, you know, I do have a headache and I had a COVID-19 and I don't get better after two weeks, what do I do? Kind of question. I never answer to these kind of questions and I apologize and I explain why I cannot answer to the question. I sometimes add some general information. For example, uh, if you have a persistent COVID symptoms, what is the general epidemiology to this and what is the accepted medications it and what would be the uh, best experts to see them kind of information I may provide. Uh, second, uh, I do try to answer all the uh, simple questions if they don't know. The problem is some of the questions are not really a question and many of them are kind of rhetorical questions to challenge me. So the, why don't you uh, keep using a vaccinations? This is not a question. This is saying that uh, I don't like vaccines. So for this kind of uh, angry statements, uh, hostile response, uh, I do not deal with them. I, uh, to, depending on the level of hostility, I sometimes just to, to make it mute so that I don't see them because uh, it's too hostile sometimes. I might block it because uh, it might just simply a very uh, against uh, aggressive statement and there was no, uh, no intention in keeping the discussion, rather just they're trying to attack me. And you never deal with attacking somebody. Uh, so, so and so on. I do have a seven or eight rules in me in dealing with these kind of response. So it all depends on what kind of uh, comments you are receiving. And it can be very difficult. Thank you so much for your response. And in line with this question, I also want to ask about how uh, do you react when you see somebody who shares misinformation on social media? Good question. Thank you very much, Yukiko. Um, again, there are two kinds of misinformation uh, generally. One is the simple misunderstanding of the data, which I raised in the beginning of my talk, such as the miscalculation of the, the vaccines, for example. In this case, I just correct the wrong interpretation mm -hmm. and the, the I attach the uh, answer to that or I may attach the what the CDC of USA is saying or the NIH recommendation or whatever, whatever, which might be helpful. Uh, some of the information, misinformation is belief derived rather than the data misunderstanding. And some of them are very close to some sort of religious kind of anti-vaxxers. Then I kind of sense that it is extremely hard to change their mind in their way of stating it. Then I sort of just ignore it sometimes. Uh, I might uh, raise other people uh, to pay attention to it sometimes by introducing that uh, these kind of people were saying that the vaccine is not effective, but uh, I don't think that it's true kind of way. So I might not respond to them directly. Again, it is very minute and it is very delicate uh, that you have to really determine the, what kind of response you are receiving. Is this mm -hmm. just a misinformation by misunderstanding mm -hmm. or it is the uh, sort of misinformation with some intention uh, it mm -hmm. is political or is it sort of religious? Okay. Uh, depending on the their intention, you have to really interpret this. Uh, mm -hmm. Response might uh, be quite different. Okay, thank you. And I've got uh, some, sorry, I've got some questions from somebody. I got direct message from participants. So question number one, um, science changes and the evidence need to be 
critically appraised, how do we translate that into effective public communication? And the second question is, how do we gain trust among the public when that happens? Mm, well, uh, again, this is a very important question and it is a very difficult one too. The level of evidence is relatively easy to determine. Mm -hmm. uh, if this is, uh, uh, for example, for the treatment wise, uh, if it is a randomized control trial, it, is, it has a sound sample size, it has a clear, clear uh, clinical effectiveness, the outcome was clearly determined and clinically important, such as death or hospitalization, then it is crystal clear that randomized control trial is easy to trust. Mm -hmm. Although we faced, particularly in the beginning of this pandemic, that the, uh, some of the uh, plagiarism in uh, articles, particularly the one uh, which is preprint. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to be careful always that the published article or preprint might not be accurate to begin with. So uh, you need uh, some reproducibility uh, and you have to see the repeated, the same outcome uh, demonstrated by different researchers in clearly stating that this medicine is effective or this medicine is not working kind of things. So we need uh, some repetition in trusting the data. Uh, we cannot really state the same way to the public that this randomized control trial showed to see, you know, 300 people enrolled in this kind of, this does not deliver the message correctly. Uh, lots of people don't like this. So the, uh, I usually use I message. I is the uh, singular uh, article for uh, stating me. So the, I do think that this, study is demonstrating that the vaccine is very effective and safe to elderly people in preventing a death, for example. So the, I do summarize the conclusion and the, I do deliver the message with my stating that the, I as an expert really recommend you that this data is trustworthy. And this in clinical medicine works very well. I, I usually use this to my patients as well. When, uh, whenever I prescribe the medicine, a, this is the me best medicine to you, I think. I always state, I think, because this adds my interpretation of the clinical trial. If the patient keep asking that, uh, what do you mean by the clinical trial, then I'll give you the detailed uh, data. But most of the patients don't. They mm -hmm. would like to know whether the medicine works for them or not. And the, uh, that is the best answer to me or not. So I usually, start with the conclusion which most patients really want. Okay, so you are very cautious about standardized, standardized opinion. So you first try to, um, um, to, to convey your own opinion and then wait. Yeah, uh, you might have seen the uh, hierarchy of the evidence. Have you ever mm -hmm. seen that? Yes. It's a kind of pyramid stating that, uh, you mm -hmm. know, the best evidence is a uh, uh, meta-analysis of the randomized control trial, followed by RCT, followed by uh, rest mm -hmm. retrospective uh, cohort study, then the, at the bottom there's expert opinion. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, which is wrong, mm -hmm. because no experts are ignorant in RCTs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we experts read all the important RCTs and interpret it, and we do know the shortcomings of each given RCTs and the, uh, the benefit of RCTs too. And within these RCTs, we know whether the RCT or evidence is applicable to this particular patient in front of me or not. Mm -hmm. So you have to have the opinion in delivering the particular care to the person who is yeah. in front of because RCT is RCT, but the mm -hmm. applicability of evidence has to be interpreted by the expert. So mm -hmm. the expert opinion, in my opinion, is really important. Okay. And it is Thank probably the, uh, above the okay. meta-analysis of RCTs in individual care. Okay. Thank you. And uh, I see uh, hand, sorry, again, Ronan, yeah. please go ahead. I totally agree with uh, Dr. Kintaro, because uh, I think um, patient care are being um, 
supposed to be personalized depending on the holistic care that we give to the patients. And yeah. um, I totally agree with that kind of approach. Uh, but I have one question with regards to your previous topic um, that you're mm -hmm. talking about. I understand that there's a lot of hostility around mass media and it takes a lot of patience and courage when having a strong visibility and appearance among these platforms. Um, how do social or me medical experts like you in Japan are visible in social media nowadays? And would you still be active around social media? Yes. I think uh, social media is the easiest way to deliver your message rather than using uh, mass media, particularly TV. Well, I don't know whether your country is still use TV as the main way of delivering mm -hmm. the message because I think the a lot of countries do have a shift towards the YouTubes or uh, other medias from the so-called mass media such as television. But uh, the problem of TV, particularly in Japan, is the lack of time. We don't have a, a sort of debate type TV programs, unlike the most uh, westernized countries we see. So the, the time given to each participant in TV program is very short. And uh, sometimes it can be just to, for one sentence. And with one sentence, you can't really deliver the message accurately. It is often exaggerated. It is an uh, overstatement or understatement. So the, it is extremely difficult in uh, uh, very quick Japanese TV programs mm -hmm. in uh, delivering the scientific uh, messages. So the uh, YouTube instead is easy because uh, the time is given to you and you can spend any time uh, as you, much as you like. Uh, I do use podcast often too. Podcast is another way to deliver mm -hmm. the messages, uh, not minding the time restriction. So the uh, the role of mass media is, mm -hmm. in my opinion, changing. And what would be the uh, finite uh, place where the mass media will stand is something I don't know. Uh, you might have some opinion about it. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. Um, you, you you deserve a, a, a an applause for everything that you do, Dr. Kentaro. Thanks. Oh, thank you so much. So, um, so next question. So, um, you shared your own role in terms um role to um for um for the usage of social media. So um, what do you think about the health authorities or professionals having social media accounts? Do you think, um, yes. uh, sorry, yeah, yes. go ahead. Uh, generally speaking, I think it is good to have a social media account uh, on all the healthcare professionals. In general, uh, you can't probably use a false name on your account when you are healthcare professionals mm -hmm. because a lot of Japanese healthcare professionals do use uh, uh, fake names not to disclose their uh, name, real name and the uh, existing organizations and the uh, professional expertise or degrees, whatever. And the, we can't really trust whether this person is really qualified healthcare professionals or not. Mm -hmm. And some of them might not be uh, the one, mm -hmm. but it is a bit tricky thing because Japan's healthcare system still do have a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the top of a hierarchy, uh, doctors exist, which I don't think is uh, correct. And the, sometimes other healthcare professionals such as pharmacists and nurses do find difficulty in expressing their opinions. Uh, also, uh, a lot of doctors who work at the university hospitals, national centers, uh, do mind what other people would say, particularly their uh, seniors and superiorities. Some might find uh, their opinions very uh, aggressive or maybe uh, too modern for those seniors. 
then uh, that might uh, cause a problem in the, the, uh, uh, the existing organizations. Mm -hmm. I think uh, WHO people might have the same the dilemma that you can't really freely express your opinions while uh, belonging to uh, WHO. So the, uh, it has a plus and minus on that. Uh, how do you deal with this dilemma? Uh, I don't have a, any short answer to it. We have to keep considering these problems, uh, inherent problems, and we have to be mindful about the potential uh, pros and the against uh, in use, use of uh, social media by healthcare professionals. Mm -hmm. So um, moving forward, do you think we need an education program to deal with this misinformation on social media for young health professionals or co or medical students? Absolutely. I do mm -hmm. agree with the, uh, I think we need the information management education to mm -hmm. everybody, not just mm -hmm. the healthcare professionals, but everybody mm -hmm. on the nation. Uh, I, I do have a belief in the, we, we need the education for survival. Uh, mm -hmm. We traditionally educations were for your knowledge. You learn language, you learn mathematics, you learn science for your knowledge and advancing your intellectuality. But uh, I think for everybody, you need the education for your survival. You need to learn how to use your finance. You need to learn how to be healthy. You need to learn how not to be attacked by somebody violent, mm -hmm. uh, particularly the, uh, uh, for uh, partic certain genders who are susceptible to certain violence. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to learn how to uh, avoid uh, robberies and uh, uh, mischiefs and uh, any kind of uh, uh, criminals. Mm -hmm. And you need to learn uh, how to uh, use social media soundly and not mm -hmm. to come to uh, any sort of problems and the, uh, even the uh, mental health problems. Mm -hmm. Lots of people in Japan uh, who use social media get mental health problems yeah. because of the very aggressive and the sometimes violent comments uh, mm -hmm. even to them. Yeah, Which this is the uh, negative aspect of social media. Yeah, yeah. You might know that uh, Japan has a very high suicide rate among mm -hmm. the developed nations and the uh, uh, bullying is uh, the, probably the uh, most reason for the younger people to die. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, I think social media is sort of taking part in uh, a lot of kind of bullying uh, by many people. So we have to deal with this issue as very important uh, in protecting uh, these younger people's life. And the, I think the education is uh, immediately uh, needed. Mm -hmm. I see, thank you. So this might be overwrapped question, but well, um, do you have any thoughts about what we can do regarding misinformation on an both individual level and societal level. I think it includes education that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Well, for the latter, the institutional level, uh, it is, I think the US CDC has been doing this. They, uh, they have been delivering the messages to counter the misinformation all the time, which is very mm -hmm. correct. I think mm -hmm. WHO is doing the same, that uh, any kind of important misinformation we have to combat and state this is wrong. We have to, do the fact checks. We have to counter the fakes. And we have mm -hmm. to keep saying that, that this is a fake news and this is the correct answer. And we, we need a, some repetition uh, institutional wise. So we Japanese government, as well as the old international bodies need uh, any kind of system to find the major fake news or misinformation which might be counterproductive in improving our healthcare or other important issues, then clearly state that this is a misinformation. Mm -hmm. Now, individual-wise, 
countering misinformation can be very, very difficult. But uh, there are some sort of ways to avoid this. And then we need uh, education. Mm -hmm. We may need a simple education to get into the sources, for example. Mm -hmm. Whenever you get the information, you have to go into the sources of the information and you need to uh, evaluate the trustfulness of the source. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them can be very deceitful and the, uh, very difficult to distinguish between the uh, authentic body and the fake body because mm -hmm. fake bodies tend to be very similar to the authentic bodies. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, they can be very cunning and the, uh, very uh, deliberate in uh, deceiving people by looking like the very authentic body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I recently saw the uh, WHO is uh, recommending not to uh, give vaccine to children, for example. Mm -hmm. And that site was really looking like WHO. So mm -hmm. <laughs> it is easy to uh, construct this kind of site, particularly in the 21st century where the uh, uh, developing a quasi-authentic website is very easy. Then, mm -hmm. uh, and the also uh, you can uh, twist and the, uh, uh, edit any kind of pictures very easily. Yeah. You don't have to be a very expert on the editing pictures. So mm -hmm. you can produce a fake news very easy. Mm -hmm. So the, you have to be very careful, but uh, still the simple education will avoid the majority of the fake news. So uh, again, I think I have to go back to my previous comments that the education is extremely important. Okay, thank you so much. So we have 10 minutes to go. So I would like to ask you guys if you have any questions so far. I'm glad that uh, uh, all Rona, the please. All the world. Yes, please. Yeah, it's me again, um, Dr. Kintaro. Um, what do you think about the stand of, of um, using open access of different researches online? Do you have any oh, thoughts or yes. ideas? Yes, uh, open, thank you. Open access articles were originally uh, regarded as a substandard. Uh, a lot of uh, journals which do not have a high quality uh, provided the open access articles by asking a lot of money by, to publish. So it was sort of disrespected. However, now it's extremely difficult to distinguish between the uh, so-called uh, the junk kind of articles and the authentic mm -hmm. articles because nowadays a lot of authentic articles and the journals do ask for open access articles. Mm -hmm. Basically, I do agree with open access because everybody can read it. Mm -hmm. If the article and the study is valuable, I think everybody, regardless of the financial power, should have access to it. I myself, uh, when I publish my articles and the asked by the editor whether you want to make it open access or not, I always answer, say, yes, please make it open access so that mm -hmm. my article will be read by everybody. I love people to read my articles. So the I think the value of the, so the, by being open access does not make by itself the value of the article. Then you have to read the article and you have to evaluate it and you have to judge whether this article is a bullshit or a very good one. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks so much, Dr. Kintaro. Thank you. I have uh, two hands. Okay, Adi, Adi Kiki, please. Thank you very much. Um, very, very insightful lecture there, Dr. Wata. I have two Thank questions you. in the center sure. around uh, the credibility of science, as it were, these days. It just seems that there is a lot, there's lots of credibility in science. For instance, uh, we've got many um, so-called experts who, like you mentioned, the conflict of interest issues. So who turn our researches that seem to you know, they don't give a clear direction. 
and as to what uh, a particular situation is. And so in that way, they fell this issue of um, hesitancy, vaccine hesitancy and disbelief by people. So how can we build, rebuild credibility in science uh, by tackling the issues of conflict of interest among scientists? Then the second one is about credibility um, in science among in the political circle. I mean, a very big example is, was when uh, Donald Trump felt that WHO was not to be trusted as he had been heavily influenced by China. So these are some other, you know, social uh, political issues affecting the credibility of science and experts. So how do we deal with this um, kind of issue? As I know that it's key knowing that there will still be many epidemics and we need to be able to work together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for the credibility of experts, uh, first, we experts has to be uh, keep being the one to be trusted. So first, we have to be uh, honest and we have to be sincere. We have to be fact-driven and uh, we have to have a courage to change when we were wrong. We need to keep being honest we have we need to avoid twisting the data based on the belief uh, political situations your financial incentives or whatever so credibility will not be provided instantly it takes time to develop the trust and it is easy to lose trust it takes only one second actually so it is very difficult task you have to keep take time and keep saying and you have to keep being honest then uh, you will develop your credibility little by little it takes time maybe it may take years uh, to gain that so there's no easy way to do it now for the political one uh, again my suggestion particularly to who is to be away from politics particularly when you state something scientific. Uh, I understand and I'm aware that WHO do have a lot of relationship between a lot of nations. And you also do have a financial incentives and receiving a lot of money from many nations. So you can't uh, disrespect any nations uh, who support WHO, I understand that. But still the statement by WHO has to be extremely neutral and not uh, based on the mindfulness to the nation uh, who provide a lot of support, which will lose the trust to the WHO. Uh, I understand this can be sometimes very difficult, but this is the only one way to keep the standard of WHO very high uh, above the, any of the uh, bodies uh, to uh, improve the health care of the world. I don't know if I can just ask a follow-up question, uh, Ms. Ke. Say it again, please. Okay, I, I wanted to ask a follow-up question. So I was seeking permission from the chair if I could ask a follow-up question to your response. Sure, yeah. Okay, thank you. So thank you, Dr. Liana. Um, sorry, Dr. Wata, you know, it's yeah. interesting because, like you said, WHO is funded by these countries, and then it's still expected to point out the ills in these different countries. So I don't know if you would say maybe the time is ripe to think of a change in the funding structure of WHO, because as it's where, it's severely underfunded, first and foremost, and most of the funding it uses to respond to epidemics is from um, the voluntary contribution from countries. So yeah. in itself, there's kind of an inherent conflict of interest already. So I don't know if moving forward, this is something we need to look at you know, critically, how the WHO is funded in order to enable it to really be a neutral umpire. Yeah, thank you for your comment. You know, uh, I'm not a member of WHO, so the, uh, for, for, for that, uh, it's kind of easy to state anything liberally. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I hope, I hope the WHO keep being a neutral 
and not uh, really biased towards the any kind of political or financial incentives. Yeah. So the uh, decision makers needs to be always independent, and the uh, there should not be any of the in, any kind of interference from anywhere outside the the body. For example, when you deal with a Ebola outbreak, the yeah. the com committee to fight against the Ebola has to be independent of any of the interference outside. Likewise, COVID-19, influenza, or any kind of healthcare problems uh, where the WHO might have uh, some section towards it, then that section needs a uh, clear, in, uh, clear uh, uh, depend independency uh, of outside bodies within the WHO. And that is ideal in the uh, uh, future. But, uh, I, and I kind of understand that uh, this is easily said, but uh, difficult to easy, do. Yeah, easily said and done. Yeah, so just, just in the same line, I'm wrapping up now. In terms of individual scientists who take uh, benefits, cash or stock from, say, pharmaceutical companies and all of that, and then are still doing research for that company, could there be another higher level of legislation other than simply stating conflict of interest that can really help to reduce the possibility of, um, you know, of uh, um, of results that are more in keeping or in favor of the funding body? Maybe yeah. something that includes yeah. that, you know, yeah. So because this is another issue that really reduces the credibility of science and does not allow science to speak with one voice. So I don't know what your suggestion in that area could be. Okay, so the uh, for the pharmaceutical companies or the any of the companies which is developing or any healthcare uh, uh, items such as vaccines, uh, basically uh, we are all friends. We are aiming at the same goal of improving the healthcare of the people in the world. So the I don't regard pharmaceutical companies as an enemy of my field. We sort of looking at the same direction. Uh, I often take the example of football match of players and the referees. So the uh, if referees are hostile against the players or the vice versa, uh, you can't really expect a good football matches and you cannot really enjoy it. So the referee needs the respect to the players and so are the uh, vice versa. However, you need to have some distinction between the role of these two bodies. You can't really pay money to the referees by the players. You can't uh, invite the uh, referees to the dinner. And the, you need to have a, some sort of clear distinction to make their role respectful and independent. Likewise, uh, it is right to have a cooperation between the clinical bodies such as doctors and the pharmaceutical companies. Otherwise, pharmaceutical companies cannot conduct a clinical trials and cannot develop evidence. So we need a cooperation. However, uh, for those who were participating in the development of each given medications, such as the uh, uh, investigators to conduct the clinical trials, should not take part in a development of clinical guideline because then you do have a conflict of interest and uh, you will push your side of medication forward in putting the uh, above the uh, recommended use of medication in a guideline, which is clearly wrong. We recently had a kind of issue in Japan by uh, president of the Infectious Diseases Society of Japan uh, who participated in the development of certain medications with Japanese pharmaceutical company uh, deliberately recommended to accept and approved this medicine uh, to the uh, list of the uh, COVID-19 medication, uh, which was criticized by me and the, some other experts. This shouldn't happen. So we need uh, some clear distinction to encourage the cooperation between pharmaceutical companies and clinical body while having and keeping the independence of the guideline sites and the recommendation site. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Wata. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so much, oh. Dr. Wata. Um, I think it's 19 past. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, we'll call it a day today. But, uh, thank you very much for wonderful and in insightful comments on uh, today's topic. And before we go, can we take pictures? Why not? Okay. Uh, by, by the way, uh, I have a Amalfi Italy in my back, yeah. which I traveled <laughs> cool. in 2019, and I really love this place. <laughs> so I keep... Yeah, I really love going around Italy too, and Amalfi is one of my favorites. Thank you Absolutely. for the appreciation. I love this place, really. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, please open your picture and uh, Defend will take the picture in a few minutes. Defend, take over, please. Wait shortly for everyone to turn on their camera. Okay, just give me one second. Perfect. Thank you all very much for taking the time to open your camera and letting me take that picture. Thank you very much. <laughs>